This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Hi, I'm Sarah Story, the Executive Director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour, a weekly conversation with creative Mississippians from across the state. We talk to artists, musicians, authors, and community workers who support the arts in their community. Today, I'm talking with Benjamin Salisbury, the museum director of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. Welcome, Benjamin. Oh, thanks for having us, Sarah. Thank you. Absolutely. We're just so thrilled to have you on the show today, and I'm just excited to learn more about what's going on in Sumner, Mississippi, and with the Emmett Till Interpretive Center. And then a little bit later on, we're just excited to hear more about you guys' new grant that you just got from the Mellon Foundation. Great. Happy to share with you all. Looking forward to it. So I'd love to start off by just just for, you know, maybe people that don't know the story of Emmett Till very well or haven't heard the story in a while. Do you mind just sharing the that that history? Sure. Uh, you're, yes. Yes, ma'am. So uh, it was the summer of 1955, uh, talking about August 1955. Um, and just to expedite, uh, you know, the disinterpretation, I'll, you know, I'm going to, there are bits and pieces that I'll, I'll be sharing. But basically, in the latter part of August of, of 1955, uh, a young man by the name of Emmett Lewis Till was vidi- visiting family members in the Mississippi Delta, uh, Money, Mississippi, to be a little bit more precise. Um, during his visit, uh, he, along with uh, Reverend Willa Parker, for whom uh, is his cousin and the late Simeon Wright, uh, stopped at Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market, which is um, in Money, Mississippi, where uh, where Emmett, based off of the account given by Reverend Willa Parker and the late Simeon Wright, whistled at Carolyn Bryant. Uh, approximately three days later from the time of the, of the wolf whistle, um, the home of Mose Wright, who was the caregiver uh, and relative of Emmett and, and Reverend Willa Parker, uh, was visited or, or rather, I guess, invaded upon by uh, Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Milam. Uh, they would then go on to abduct Emmett Till out of the home of Mose Wright, uh, for, for whom he was never seen alive again. Approximately three days after the abduction, uh, Emmett's body was recovered from the Tallahatchie River. Uh, and from the point of the recovery of his body to the now somewhat famous or infamous trial that took place in, in Sumner uh, in September 1955. A not guilty verdict was rendered and, and these two men were acquitted. Um, a few months later, their confession uh, um, and their account of things were, were then published uh, in Look Magazine, which uh, again, also in 56, you have you know, in our neighboring state of, of Alabama, uh, the bus boycott of Montgomery going on. So, so, so um, it's it, we can probably we will probably get into this, but there is a direct correlation between the the murder and acquittal, well, the murder of Emmett Till and and the acquittal of these two men, uh, and and the civil rights movement. But again, to kind of help save with time, we can get into that at another part of the discussion, possibly. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. It is it's a tough story um, to hear, and in the whole but it's so important to remember and speak about and um, and especially for the community that you're in. So tell us a little bit more about the Emmett Till Interpretive Center. You know, how did that come about? How did, you know, what was the purpose, et cetera? Great. So, so excuse me. So you have the, you know, you have the civil rights movement of the fifties and sixties uh, and to a, I think to an, at least to a measurable extent, you see progress and change in a lot of different places, right? Uh, folk, you know, black folk get the right to vote. You're seeing laws being passed that kind of help protect those rights, and and you're seeing again progress on a societal level um, um, as the years and decades go by. Uh, but with that being said, it wasn't until the mid 2000s that our community, uh, the Tallahatchie County community, uh, began to publicly and 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 intentionally talk about race and racism and what racial reconciliation could look like. And so uh, this process um, gave way through the creation of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission, which was spearheaded 
uh, by a gentleman named Jerome G. Little, well, the late Jerome G. Little. Uh, he and, again, the, the cohort that would become the commission was comprised of 18 citizens, black and white, all of whom were from Tallahatchie County, all of whom uh, had a uh, working memory of, of that time being the time for which uh, the trial took place. And over the course of about a year, maybe not quite a whole year, uh, these folk, along with a few others in our community, uh, came together uh, through the help and the assistance of the William Winters Institute uh, to, 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 you know, to try to work through what it meant, you know, what it means to, to grow up in a community and a, and in a social climate is the one that they did. But to do it for but to have those conversations, not just to point blame, not just to. Uh, you know, have moments of, of crying or, or frustration, but to really look inward, right, and look inward together, and then try to harness those truths that are shared uh, into something that, you know, is progressive and positive. So in 2007, the commission uh, uh, created a, a resolution slash apology that was given to members of the Teal family, uh, and it was presented on the courtyard steps, and that helped uh, kind of be a springboard for the restoration of the courthouse. Uh, and the importance of that is we, you know, they wanted to have something tangible to give way to the work of the commission, right? It's one thing to say, I'm sorry. And, but, you know, the reality of the matter is, you know, you have a child that was murdered. You have a mother that spent the entire, the rest of her life seeking justice on behalf of her son and others. Uh, and so saying, I'm sorry, just kind of falls short. Right. Uh, and so, and so, our community and our and yeah, our community understood that that in addition to writing these words on paper, uh, we needed to try to live that out. And so the restoration of the courthouse uh, became a, one of the ways for which we wanted to live out the apology. We wanted to create a space, or rather, create spaces and environments that that acknowledge uh, our history, but also acknowledge our resolve to be better to each other going forward. So the process from the time of the apology being in 2007 up to the opening of the courthouse in 2015 helped us realize, well, in addition to that, we need to have a space or spaces that deal with sharing this narrative, that of the, the Emmett Till tragedy, but also our own reckoning or our own coming, you know, coming together uh, narrative as a county and community. Uh, and that would serve, and, and as a result of that, that's, Kind of how and why the Emmett Till Interpretive Center showed up. That's amazing. Well, that's just so cool to hear. And um, we're just so grateful to have this important uh, space in our state and, and in that community. So so how did you get involved with, with the Emmett Till Interpretive Center? Are you from the area? Did you grow up with the story? Or is this new for you? Yeah, great question. So I'm a native. I'm a Delta native. I am a you know country boy through and through, uh, born and raised uh, in Tallahatchie County, about a mile or so outside of Sumner, Mississippi. So uh, the you know the history concerning the that space, and when I say that space, I mean the courthouse and and its ties to this tragedy, and in some ways its ties to uh, this national narrative of the past and even present has always been a part of, I guess, my upbringing. Uh, I, again, being a native of the area, you know, I, I went to the, the local high school, which is West Tallahatchie High School, uh, you know, part of the graduating class 2003. Uh, I, I did my undergrad at MVSU, completed it um, in 2008. Uh, still being very closely tied to family, friends, and others from the area. Uh, it wouldn't be until around 2016, however, that I would find myself um, uh, working with the uh, Emmett Till Interpretive Center directly. Uh, and so I kind of came on board actually as a volunteer and then as time progressed, um, my office and capacity of service uh, has changed along with, uh, you know, along with the, the growth and continued uh, work of the Interpretive Center. But, but, but yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely a native of the, of the county and community. And, and so, but I got my start officially with the Interpretive Center in uh, March 2016, believe it or not. That's awesome. Well, happy anniversary then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. That's great. Much. So tell us a little bit more about what the Interpretive Center does today. You guys do some programs. You know, what what's going on there now? Sure. So I'll speak to at least uh, the programming prior to COVID. 
Um, and, and, and then to some extent, I'll speak to the, the pivot in, you know, in, you know, post COVID or during COVID. So ultimately we, what we aim to do is, is, is uplift the memory and legacy of Mamie Till Mobley and Emmett. And we want to do that, not just by, I mean, one of the ways that has been done is to engage visitors, uh, with this narrative, but then the, uh, another point of engagement that we work, uh, that we work towards is, is, is by reaching out to the youth in our community or in a, a, you know, adjacent communities and engaging them also in, in the Emmett, Till, Emmett and Mamie Till narrative, but then also in civil rights and also emphasizing to them the fact that, yeah, you know, without a doubt, you do have those, you know, more prolific figures of the civil rights being, you know, Dr. King and Rosa Parks. But the other reality around that is the civil rights movement was made off of people who never made the history books. And that it was made off of, you know, young folk, their age, teenagers and, and, and whatnot that, you know, that, that organized and, and came together to try to make a lasting difference in their world. And that, you know, that they can see themselves in progress and in change and in working together. And that they are, you know, to be the best stewards possible of their own narratives and their own stories. And so we try to express that through the arts. And one of the ways in particular that we have in times past has been through uh, the creation of photo documentaries. And so we've been able to host uh, summer programs that engage youth in the creation of their own stories by way of photo documentaries and in sharing those stories with the community in the courtroom or in the center. Uh, but that, you know, that work has now kind of expanded uh, in some ways into, well, we still continue that, right? We still want to engage youth and others. Uh, with the arts and and using the arts as a way to to try to, um, I guess, heal past traumas while also you know reimagining new narratives and things of that nature. But uh, but in addition to those to that particular uh, program or that particular activity or project, uh, we're looking at ways to to develop you know curriculum that that deals specifically with the Emmett Till narrative uh, and and finding ways to help engage schools and districts. Uh, in Mississippi and, you know, in everywhere else to, to kind of give even greater emphasis to the impact uh, that, that the life and legacy of Emmett and Mamie Till have absolutely had here and arguably all around the world. This is Sarah Story, the Executive Director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. You are listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. To have access to all Arts Hour interviews, Subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. You can also listen to the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. Today we have Benjamin Salisbury, the museum director of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. Thanks again so much for being here with us, Ben. Oh, the pleasure is all mine, Sarah. Thank you for having us. So before the break, we were discussing the programming that you guys do throughout the community of Sumner, Mississippi, but then also you guys do curriculum development that goes probably all over the world, I would guess. Well, I mean, that's, we're an extremely, and I do want to emphasize extremely early stages of that, mm-hmm. like that, that, that's, that's part of the, the digital pivot, right? Because prior to, um, you know, again, prior to COVID, you know, we had a lot of face-to-face interaction and a lot of uh, visitors and, and other, th- and, and also our, our center serves as a community space. And so the community, uh, you know, I mean, that space, uh, it, well, at least was open for community to, to share whatever, um, you know, whatever programming some of those other, some of our other organizations in the area have, you know, we, we avail this space to community uh, as well as, all, you know, from time to time hosting uh, other meetings and, and whatnot that, that dealt directly with uh, community issues and matters, education and otherwise. Uh, but again, due to COVID, we've had to take a much 
we, you know, we've had to go, or at least consider going, um, using some of the, you know, various digital platforms to engage and re-engage others. Uh, last year, one of the, I think one of the highlights of, of, of the digital pivot uh, was being able to host readings from, from different uh, writers, some of whom were, were poets, and, and I think one of whom was a, a poet laureate uh, during, um, during the summer of last year that, that garnished a lot of, of visitors and attentions in, you know, in, in one of the Zoom rooms, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, our intent is to continue to engage uh, folks locally and abroad, right? Like community uh, is not just the very proxal location of, of Sumner, Webb, to Weiler, uh, although they are without a doubt, but our view of community is, you know, all of whom who care um, about the memory of, of Emmett and, I mean, of Emmett and, and Mamie Till Mobley, uh, but then also those who care about um, um, looking for ways to, to engage um, honestly and truthfully concerning racial reconciliation. And then also trying to find and cultivate the ways to process that, uh, whether it's, you know, person to person or, you know, on a much larger scale. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I, the digital pivot in some ways has helped that. It, it's forced us to definitely, you know, promote uh, our app, the Emmett Till Memory Project, which, uh, which gives visitors an opportunity to go to different sites that are tied to the Emmett Till narrative uh, in Tallahatchie County, well, in Delta, Mississippi, as well as a few sites uh, um, in, in the Chicago area. Uh, and, and we've explored using social media and, and other uh, uh, platforms to help, again, uplift the, the memory of Emmett and Mamie, while also calling people to kind of look inward and, and taking into account where we are as a society, but then where we are as individuals and what we can do to try to make the world a little bit better. Absolutely. Well, that's that's great that you guys have been able to shift to more digital platforms. Was did you guys have to close during during for a while during COVID? Are you still closed? What's going on now at the Interpretive well, Center? Yeah, great question, Sarah. So we're we've closed we've closed from from having visitors, mm -hmm. right? And 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 in a large in large part because one well, there's no large part because of COVID. But sure. specifically around COVID is the fact that in our county and community, um, even prior to COVID, you know, we've had we have our struggles and obstacles concerning uh, health care and, and, and access to health care and and having to go 20 plus miles sometimes to, you know, to get to anything, especially a hospital or this or that. And so we just felt it. We just believe that for at least for us, for our community, for our organization, um, it, it was probably the safest thing. The safest thing to do would be to um, suspend visiting. I mean, suspend visitors until you know we've kind of gotten a much better handle and containment on COVID here and regionally. And so we look, uh, we, we believe that we can safely reopen uh, later this year, and we're in the process of, of of you know making that a reality even now. That's great to hear. Yes, ma'am. So. I'm really excited. It, it was national news that you guys got one of the five coveted grants from the Mellon Foundation um, for what they're calling the Monuments Project. And so I, I uh, printed out the description so I could read it for our listeners that may not be familiar with the project. So I'll, I'll read that and then and then we want to hear more about how Emmett Till is going to, Emmett Till Interpretive Center is going to use these funds in the community. So this is the description from the Mellon Foundation. Statues are not just bodies and bronze, and monuments are not just stone pillars. They instruct. They lift up the stories of those who are seen, dominate the stories of those who are unseen, and too often pro propagate menacingly incomplete accounts of our country's past. So I'd love to hear more about how you guys found out about this opportunity, what you're thinking through, you know, how, how you want to grow what you guys are doing with this incredible grant support. Yeah, great, great question again, Sarah. So uh, going back just a little bit, I believe it was the summer of 2019 when when the world sort of made sense. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, myself and, and, our, and our executive director, Patrick Weems, uh, were speaking to a group that, that, were, that were visiting in the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner. Um, and 
if my memory serves me correctly, and I think it does, uh, one of the persons in the audience uh, worked with or worked for Mellon. Um, and so after we uh, shared what, you know, our work and shared our story, uh, that, that, that person, just to kind of speed this up, that person made contact with us about possibly uh, uh, submitting a proposal to, to their foundation. And thankfully, you know, we were able to do that. Unfortunately, uh, COVID kind of interrupted the process in some ways. Uh, but, but in spite of COVID, uh, we were able to kind of, again, you know, I think us choosing to still try to find ways to engage and be true to, to who we are and why we are as an organization and also as community members, uh, you know, we were kind of, I think that helped us stay appropriately positioned uh, to, you know, to be able to submit this proposal. And thankfully, the proposal was accepted. And, and you know, this, you know, and, and with its acceptance, it's going to help us, uh, you know, it's definitely going to help sustain us while we, you know, possibly, well, not possibly, but, but probably uh, expand our, you know, expand our capacity a little bit. But then also, it's going to help us engage community. It's going to help us uh, do exactly what that grant speaks to, which is uh, uh, appropriate commemoration. Uh, one of the sites in particular uh, that, that, that we're looking at for, at further interpretation of or more permanent interpretation of uh, is, is, again, absolutely uh, targeted to, to be a site where a much more permanent fixture is there. And not just for the reason and purposes of, of sharing, um, uh, you know, the tragic component to, you know, to the Emmett Hill narrative, but to be a call for education, right, and a call for, for people coming together to learn and grow together. And, and, and we believe that done the right way, commemorative work or commemorative, um, um, well, yeah, done the right way, acts and arts of, of, of commemoration have a way of speaking to people that goes, you know, just a little bit further than, than spoken word. Uh, and that's not a knock or diss against spoken word, but but again, we are you know to the best of our ability, we want to use the arts and we want to use uh, the spaces that make up who and what we are as a community uh, to kind of help share where we are um, as as a society, and that those truths aren't just um, a Tallahatchie County truth. That that the things that Tallahatchie County and other places, uh, and and even Mississippi in a lot of ways have faced, uh, is, is not alien to the rest of society. But, and that's, you know, that's what it is. But the good news is we're not at the mercy of history. We can learn from history. And so uh, cultivating and or uh, creating uh, spaces for commemoration then becomes a call to remembering where we come from, but then working to making the future, you know, that much better. And, and so, so that proposal and, and being accepted with, you know, from Mellon helps us figure out the best ways to do that. So, so we're, you know, privileged, excited, uh, and looking forward to, to doing this work while also engaging community uh, in the upcoming, you know, you know, months and arguably, you know, years or so in, in, in commemoration and how that commemoration can possibly spur community and others to, um, you know, to look inward yet again and, and, and call for change here, and hopefully that serves as a model for other places um, in Mississippi and, dare I say, around the country. Absolutely. Well, it's definitely been um, a, a conversation worldwide, especially over this past year with the Black Lives Matter movement and just all the horrible deaths that we've seen. Um, did did that change the work that you guys did any last year when, when all of that was happening or or were you guys already pretty much talking about it and and had it top of mind anyway? Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't want to come off as if we have a monopoly on, on the space. And by no means are we trying to, um, you know, play or, or compete in the oppression Olympics, right? But, well, I mean, there's no but to that. That's, that's just what that is. With that being said, uh, when 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 the events that took place last year, especially uh, you know the the, the murder of, of Breonna Taylor and then you know the you know the murder of George Floyd, um, you know that you know those tragic events, uh, you know spoke to and, and in some ways speak to, um, you know speak to a reality that that 
that has been present long before last year. Mm-hmm. And I think in some ways things kind of have kind of come to a head as a result of, of those tragic events, you know, making national news. Uh, but for us, you know, it, you know, it, it, it continues to serve as a clear indication as to why there's a need for an interpretive center, right? And not just because, you know, you can do a pro, you know, you do a project that points to the bad things, but we want to try to do the best we can to, to, to uplift the importance of, of those who have a mind and a heart and a will uh, to, to look at the world around them and, and then look at themselves uh, to then try to find ways to make it better. I, you know, we don't dare act as if we have the answers because we don't, right? Like we're not the experts, so to speak, but we do believe and to some extent can, can attest to uh, the potential a place or a people uh, can tap into when they choose to be very intentional and deliberate around coming together and 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 working through processes through the arts and or uh, just through person to person dialogue uh, with solutions in mind. So so when again so when the murders of George Floyd happened and and and, and Breonna Taylor and and the hang, you know and the and the the hang I mean people being found you know hanging from trees last summer and whatnot when when that became prevalent. Uh, it, it further affirmed our resolve to continue to do the work and for the purposes that the work exists on our behalf to begin with. This is Sarah Story, the Executive Director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. You are listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. To have access to all Arts Hour interviews, Subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. You can also listen to the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee only financial advising firm and co host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart devices podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. Today, we're joined with Benjamin Salisbury, the museum director of the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Sumner, Mississippi. So we've been talking about the Emmett Till Interpretive Center, its new grant from the Mellon Foundation that will allow the work that they're doing in Sumner to expand and grow, which is super exciting. What what else is going on that you, you guys have been working on that you're excited about right now, Ben? Yeah, so so so, you know, again, uh, looking at at the safest ways to reopen is is absolutely one of the you know the highlights, um, and and one of the most I don't want to say time consuming, but but it's definitely something that that has required some real thought and some real, um, um, for lack of a better word, research because we want to do that. You know that that's that's kind of how we started, uh, and and thankfully thankfully you know COVID is taking a turn. That would allow us to, you know, to not just have those conversations, but, but to actually, you know, see it come to fruition. So reopening is a big thing, uh, but 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 also, um, you know, possibly, uh, you know, being able to host, uh, you know, our summer event, our our summer, uh, you know, youth program event or a fellowship program, is a very big deal for us. Uh, along with, um, you know, just just along with finding those other ways to continue to engage. Uh, in Tallahassee County and, and and some of the surrounding areas. So those are some of the those are a few of the things that we're looking at and, and working on um, at present. That's great. That's exciting that it's it's finally time to even consider a reopening plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so bef- before this worldwide pandemic, what who what type what does your visitorship look like? Is it mostly local people? Do you have people coming out of town to to see the center, what does that look like for the Emmett Till Interpretive Center? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Sarah. So, prior to COVID, uh, our, I think we had a, I think we had a relatively, well, 
I guess it depends how you ask, right? Like, like a lot of our visitors, a lot of our visitors to the sites, right? And by sites, I mean center, courthouse, and, and some of those other, um, again, some of the other points to, you know, to visit that are directly tied to uh, the Teal narrative. Uh, a lot of those visitors were either from people from different parts of Mississippi, but then also uh, just a wide range of, of other visitors from, from other parts of the country and even having international visitors from time to time. Uh, our international visitors was probably, you know, the, the smallest demographic, but still a measurable one, wherein I think the largest visiting pool uh, varied from age, uh, uh, walks of life, whether they were youth or, or church groups, um, um, or just you know a family or individuals that you know that that had an interest in in civil rights and and how the Emmett Till story is part you know an integral part of you know the American civil rights story, uh, and then of just a few other you know demographics you know in, in between those places and spaces, even uh, you know even folks that that you know that do work in the Delta. From time to time, they've they visited to have conversations with us, not just around. I mean, those conversations uh, dealt with our work and and how it's tied to the Emmett Till tragedy, but then how that how the culture impacts uh, customs and practices in in the places they work. So yeah, I mean, the visiting pool uh, varied and, and is very diverse, and so we you know we're looking forward to again reopening and seeing how uh, post COVID our visiting demographic. Uh, will will play out short term and long. That's great. And so, in the interpretive center, you go, you mentioned that you guys act as a community center as well. What other types of so for people who aren't as familiar with smaller town Mississippi, you know, many <laughs> many times um, spaces like yours act as all sorts, you know, a space for all sorts of different activities. Tell Absolutely. us, give paint us a picture of what that looks like for for Sumner, Mississippi. Uh, so, so Sumner, Mississippi, is a town with a population of. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be conservative and say, um, approximately 300, maybe maybe 315, depending on what day of the week you ask. Somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, to to give a little bit of, of of historical background, in in 1955, the population of Sumner was a little bit over 500. So wow. it's never been, you know, like a huge um, or a densely populated location. But but again, uh, cons you know, the citizenship or at least the numbers off of I want to say 2010 census and such is around a 300, 320 somewhere in there. Uh, with that being said, uh, the 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 county, right, Tallahassee County. Uh, it has a population of of less than fourteen thousand people, uh, and so the county is comprised of mm, about let's see, you have Sumner, Webb, Tawiler, uh, you also have Charleston, probably being the largest of our towns in in Tallahassee County. Uh, you have Glendora, and then you have like those you know the, just the subsets of those areas. Uh, so with so having said that, uh, you would all. In, in, in our community, or, or rather speaking about the center and how it has served uh, town-wise and in some ways county-wise, uh, it has, you know, it has been a place where uh, in times past, uh, folks could visit on a weekly basis to learn more about um, things to look out for as a first-time parent, uh, which was a program, I mean, so the program was known as, I think it's Baby University, uh, and, 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 that, and that program, you know, kind of gave folks a little bit of things to look out for and be mindful of, you know, when you have a toddler, when you have a newborn and, and things of that nature. And then later that week, you would have, you know, an AA group that, that would use the building to host their meetings. Uh, and then depending on the time of the year, of course, you would have, you know, summer youth uh, fellowship workers that, in addition to learning about Teal Narrative, sometimes they would even um, um, give tours and, and lead facilitation conversations with our visitors. Um, and so, in addition to that, periodically you would have other community members that would use the space either for uh, uh, to, to, to host meetings around whatever community issue or matter that was going on, town, school, et cetera. Uh, but then sometimes you also had folks that would just use the building uh, for social events, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, you know, like a reception for a wedding or a repast or or, or just a number of, of, of events, I think, 
I think people in, in relatively larger towns take for granted because, you know, they have uh, uh, buildings that, that serve a very specific purpose. But um, and, and hopefully maybe one day, you know, that'll change. But as of right now, uh, thankfully, prior to COVID, we've been able to, you know, this building has served in addition to the direct programmatic stuff we've done. It's been, an, you know, an ally and, and, and been able to serve as a place to assist uh, community members and some and some of their community needs when it comes to um, uh, just knowing that there is a space available uh, that that will allow them to kind of do whatever you know do the good work that they're doing in whatever capacity that is. That's great. Well, I'd love to learn more about the the fellowship program that you mentioned. So that's a a summer youth fellowship program. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So so in years past and and possibly this year, fingers crossed. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> tell y'all it's happening in the end. Oh goodness, it can't happen. But 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 if all things go the way we hope them to go, uh, this program is one that usually lasts anywhere between six to eight weeks during the summer months. Uh, so anywhere between like the latter part of June or very early July to the first or second week of August, or sometimes from June, middle of June to about the middle of July, somewhere in there. Uh, whatever six to eight week. We, you know, that works for everybody that's going to be a part of it. Uh, we engage youth uh, in the area. Well, they've been in some, the majority of them have been in the area. Uh, we don't discourage any, you know, any youth for, for applying or, or, or trying to participate. But the majority of the youth that we've been able to engage with have been in our very local, you know, been local teenagers in middle, middle school to um, upper, I mean, to freshman, early undergrad folk. Uh, in the area. Uh, and so, again, that program is one that, you know, where, where we, or well, specifically whoever, our, like our youth coordinator, uh, would, would, will speak very directly to the fellowship uh, participants around sometimes, it, I mean, it, any, a number of things, whether it's uh, the Emmett Till narrative or the Emmett and Mamie Till narrative, but then also sometimes we would use current events, right, and, and give them, give the youth a space to kind of share their thoughts on things and, and try to engage them in critical thinking around how we're connected to history and how uh, um, uh, sometimes we're not nearly as, as far removed from things of the past as we think. And that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world, because just as sure as you have examples of, of young folk and others uh, coming together and working together to try to help make impacts in their community, you know, they too can do the same thing. But, you know, and it's one thing to say that, but you know, because we try to emphasize uh, the use of the arts, you know, the medium or the media for which we've, we've used in times past has been uh, photo documentaries and, and having folk that are way better at it than, than I am uh, come in for a week or two or however long uh, they're able to um, uh, assist us in this process, uh, engage youth in the technicals concerning uh, how to actually capture a picture or how to actually um, um, use uh, that medium to share a story and share a perspective that possibly or probably wouldn't be uh, known otherwise. And then kind of giving them the space, you know, to, to narrate and or have other folks that are that are part of the narrative that they're sharing narrate their work. And then and then they expound on that to the community at large. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in our efforts to continue that while also looking at ways to possibly expand that, we're looking at and other potential partners to, to work with, some of whom being, again, in the county community, but, but arguably and possibly uh, folk that are a part of a, a adjourning or, a, or connected counties. Uh, because we know that, in, you know, for one, the, the, the Emmett Hill narrative is one that is not a Tallahassee County exclusive. Um, uh, we know that there are, uh, in, in this space alone, you know, it also involves LaFleur County and Sunflower County, but, you know, and that's just the lowest of hanging fruit. Uh, and so we're looking at ways to be true to that reality uh, when it comes to how we engage uh, youth and other community members, whether they're in the Tallahassee County community or, or not. So, so, so yeah, the, the, we think, fingers crossed, but we believe that possibly this summer uh, we will be able to host this program again, even if we have to look at other uh, technologies to kind of help facilitate uh, uh, the conversations and, and, and the time spent with, with, with the fellowship uh, participants and, and those that would help them with the creation of the photo documentaries. That's wonderful. Really neat to hear. Thanks. So 
how has um have you seen the community change the, the community surrounding interpreters interpretive center change with the opportunities that you've provided them to to have these discussions to have these you know hard conversations to to create an, a public apology for what for the history have you seen any changes in the community or is it yeah so you know, you know i want to be very mindful and careful when i when i say when i say well with whatever i say concerning change i want to be and not that i haven't been honest right because you know i try to be a, an honest person uh and and this kind of work you know we absolutely do the best we can to to uplift the truth and uplift truth telling, while also um, while also living that out. Right, mm -hmm. it's one thing to say it, a whole other thing to 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 exhibit it. Right, mm -hmm. and and to do that, you know, again on purpose. So a couple of examples that I could give, or at least surface examples I can give, is the fact that. You know, in 1955, this square that that the Interpretive Center is, you know, is is headquartered in or headquartered, you know, was like almost an exclusively, you know, white business square. Mm -hmm. uh, to, now, granted, I wasn't there in 1955, sir, <laughs> but having said that, uh, I know, right? Sometimes some some mornings <laughs> I question, but that's a whole nother interview. That's a whole nother, you know, Sunday <laughs> conversation. But the uh, well, all jokes aside, uh, uh, there was a time where the, the, it, it was a very, um, it was a, it wasn't just a sentiment. Uh, looking looking at the demograph of the square, it, it it would be somewhat easy to draw the conclusion that 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 you know that that this is a place and space where 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 black businesses seldomly had an opportunity to you know to to open. Black dollars, to some extent, were welcomed, but but having um, black folk or, or businesses owned by black folk uh, in this space was just really not high. You know, the likelihood of it. Let's say the likelihood of it was 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 very low. Um, from the time of the apology to the opening of the interpretive center and 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 the reopening of the courthouse or courtroom slash courthouse, well, courtroom and, and courthouse. Um, we've been able to see uh, businesses owned by by African American women from the area, um, and so uh, with that, you know, seeing that play out and, and having those businesses patronized, um, I think serves as as one of the most immediate examples for which um, um, we can point to change. Now, again, I would be remiss to present what has taken place on the square and or you know in our county and community uh if i if 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 i told you that you know that we had it all figured out that we were a utopic society and all that good stuff i would be flat out lying mm -hmm. and y'all didn't call me to lie to y'all and <laughs> i try to make it a point not to do that no way uh but i can speak to the fact i can speak to to the belief that i and 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 the other team members have being patrick weems and elliot long um, that you know that it is our desire again to continue to to position people to give real thought to to the spaces we all share and how we can share those spaces in a way that absolutely promotes progress, equity, uh, and and the belief in one another and and how that plays out short term and long term. This is Sarah Story, the Executive Director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. You are listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. To have access to all Arts Hour interviews, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. You can also listen to the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your